friends, welcome to episode two of our three-part series, Illuminating Intersectionality, a conversation that we created with Target's Black Beyond Measure initiative. I'm your host, Fran of Hey Fran Hey, and I'm joined today by my beautiful, lovely co-host, Dr. Takia Robinson and Jada Ball Jades of the Getting Grown podcast. If you haven't watched the first episode, I highly suggest you go and do that. We weaved our stories and sources together in a really beautiful way, and I think you'll be missing out on the overall vision and conversation that we created. So Kia, if you don't mind, can you give a quick recap on what episode one was about for those who may have missed it? Sure. So in episode one, we talked about the critical importance of discussing identity within the context of power. Mm. Uh, we did an overview of what intersectionality is, talked about its utility and the core tenets of how to understand and practice it. And then we spoke of our, our identities and how they were shaped by our academic experiences, whether that be in predominantly white spaces or predominantly black spaces, but what our educational experiences have taught us about what it means to be a black girl or a black woman mm -hmm. in society. Thank you for that. I think you saw it. <laughs> she's, she's the doctor. Right? <laughs> so like I said, if you haven't caught that, definitely go and watch that now. Today we're illuminating the intersection of race and class. It's a conversation that is near and dear to me, but I know that all of us <laughs> can relate in certain capacities. Um, I always share and remind people that um, I just left the New York City Housing Authority, you know, NYCHA, the projects. Um, I'm 40. Mm -hmm. I turned 40 earlier this year and I just left in my mid-20s. So I'm mm -hmm. not that far removed from that experience and that, that remembering, you know, of what we had to endure and go through just to survive. Um, so all I remember is when my consciousness, I like to say, allow me to be woo-woo for a second. <laughs> my consciousness, you, okay, <laughs> I'm in silk and a mule. <laughs> no, but when my consciousness came online, figuratively, you know, and I remember in my mid-20s how much I was going through once I moved, once my financial circumstances started changing, and I was really able to step back and observe what we had experienced. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you can't fully see it until you're on that observation deck mm -hmm. outside of it. Um, and just the ways that I was seeing the system, it almost felt like Neo in the Matrix. You know, when he suddenly <laughs> saw the codes on the walls and it was like, oh, wait a minute, mm -hmm. what is this system, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like that awareness comes online at some point. Um, and then the other aspect of it too is seeing how you participate mm -hmm. in upholding the systems mm -hmm. as well, whether it's like consciously, unconsciously. Um, and then lastly, trying to figure out now that I am aware, now that I'm seeing how I participate, what are the ways that I can design a new way of living, a new way of moving through the world and kind of anchor down a new vision for our communities, you know, whether local or global. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of the three layers for me of how I was trying to make sense of this experience of race and class, right? But before that, <laughs> I want to tell you guys, I was telling you guys about that folklore, um, this, this tale that just hits home. I sent it to both of y'all. <laughs> and it's, it's a story that I read on Paulo Coelho's blog years ago, right? It's called The Fisherman and the Businessman. And so obviously I'm paraphrasing because <laughs> I'm not going to read it word for word. But so what happened is there was this businessman on vacation in like a small fishing village in Brazil. And while he was relaxing, as business people pretend to do, <laughs> <laughs> he sees this fisherman on a little boat and he's impressed by the fisherman's precision, right? Mm -hmm. He just comes, gets his three fish, gets back on the boat and leaves. Next day comes, gets his three fish, gets back on the boat and leaves. And he's like, wow, he's really good at this. So he goes up to him and says, why don't you stay longer? Mm -hmm. You know, like, if you're that good, why not catch more fish? Mm -hmm. And the fisherman tells him, because I get exactly what I need. This is all my family and I need for the day. And then I go home. And the businessman is like, okay, but what do you do with the rest of your day? <laughs> He's like, I take naps with my wife. I play with my kids. And then in the afternoon, I hang out with my friends, listen to live music. We dance, we sing, we drink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... The businessman is like, listen, 
I have a PhD in business management. And let me give you some advice. If you stay longer, you get more fish. If you get more fish, you'll be able to have more resources. With more resources, you can get a bigger boat. With a bigger boat, you can have a company. With a company, you can have a distribution network with canned foods, <laughs> canned fish. Mm -hmm. From that, you can have a headquarters. You can leave Brazil. Um, and what was the other advice? Oh, he told them you can go on the stock exchange when mm -hmm. your company goes public and you'll be rich forever. NFTs. <laughs> NFTs. <laughs> a fish NFT. <laughs> you and then the, the fisherman goes, okay, so then what? And he says, and then after you make all that money, you get to retire and then you come home to your house and you take naps with your wife <laughs> and you play with your kids. And then at nighttime, you go and drink with your friends and be merry. Mm -hmm. And the fisherman said, is that not what I'm doing now? <laughs> and that's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. And it just hit, it's so simple, but it hit home because I think it's easy for us to say, well, I'm the fisherman or I'm the businessman, but I actually think that the truth is that we're both. Yes, absolutely. We're these people of two worlds, mm -hmm. of what we've been indoctrinated to believe is success and what we intuitively feel called to. You know, the fisherman is just living through his experience. Mm -hmm. The businessman is living through his experience as well. And I really feel like we're these people of two worlds. And to mm -hmm. me, that's the intersection of race and class. Mm -hmm. Like you were explaining in the episode yesterday. It's like, how do we exist? And how do you know what's right or wrong when we're just feeling our way? And like Neo in the Matrix, you're just coming online to the realities. Mm -hmm. I know there was a story that you wanted to share. Oh no, in, re in relation to your story mm -hmm. um, or to the, to the folklore, this morning I was having a conversation with my driver on the way here. <laughs> and and uh, we were just talking about work and capitalism. And, and I said, listen, my goal is to make sure my family's good. Like right. that's that's my goal. I want to travel, I want to eat, and I want to make sure my family's good. And yeah. that's that's it. I just yeah. want to make sure we're comfortable and have what we need, and we don't have to want. And that's where the buck stops there for me. I'm good. Like as long as I'm enjoying where I'm at. Yeah. So when I read that story right after, I was like, look at me, a fisherman. <laughs> And you know, there are people, because I have always sort of, you know, I'm always just so grateful. And that doesn't mean that because you're grateful for where you are, that you don't also have faith in wanting more. Like, it's okay to do that. Yes. But I'm also someone that I'm like, man, I just see how far I've come. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, from being in NYCHA, and, and if you've experienced that life, like always looking around your shoulder, you know, coming, being mindful of like, what time am I coming? Because you just never know who's in the elevator. Just like, there's a PTSD right. with your for experience, sure. your daily lived experience. And it was interesting for me because I was going to NYCHA, with NYCHA like it's a club. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm living in, in this, you know, complex. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that that's what it's called because mm -hmm. it really is that. And then going to Riverdale Country School, you know, where I'm in classrooms with hedge fund kids, hedge fund kids and trust fund kids, and they, kind of viewed me like, oh, okay, she got in here. That's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> and right. there were ways that, like, they knew that it was merit-based, you mm -hmm. know? But there was a lot of ways that I wasn't seen either, like right. when they would plan the senior class trip. Mm -hmm. And it's like a $10,000 trip we're to going Paris. To yes. <laughs> you know, I yes. feel like everyone's experienced uh -huh. that. And then I'm sitting there like, oh, sh shoot. Yeah. Like, I don't think I can experience my senior class. It's and true. no yeah. one considered that because it was yeah. like so far removed yeah. from their reality. And yeah. that's what's so interesting. We were talking yesterday about the system and how, you know, it. we're conditioned to believe that this is just the way it is. But right. like you were saying, when you start to get new perspective and you gain the capacity to sort of zoom out and mm -hmm. look at these things functioning and, and even see the way that you function within a particular system, um, it makes me think about how, you know, we think about the system was designed, it, when it was designed, we were not seen as humans, we were seen as labor, right? you know? Right. And so think about that within the uh, context of capitalism and, you know, the big goal being mm -hmm. sort of gaining, you know, the, the American dream, consuming and, and just amassing a, a lot of things. And somewhere along the way, we lost sight of what our own sort of 
visions and goals Absolutely. are ourselves. for ourselves. Our own and yes. feed those lies to other Absolutely. people, which is what makes them want to come over yes. here. And that's a, you just hit it. Okay, you set my segue. Because <laughs> right. There you go. <laughs> my mom, who is foreign born, and this is another piece of how we uphold the systems, right? Whether consciously or unconsciously. She's in Dominican Republic. My mom comes from a farming village, right? Her aunts and uncles are coming with the gold and that really expensive perfume mm -hmm. and the really nice clothes. And she's like this farmer kid, like, wow, America <laughs> must be amazing. And here my aunts and uncles are kind of like, pretending that you know that they just like live in large like yeah. we made it mm -hmm. so here goes my mom like when i'm of age i'm leaving this beautiful safe farming village which let's not romanticize it either is mm -hmm. you know not the easiest Absolutely. living but she had everything she needed mm -hmm. and um she comes to the states and this is the part that to me was so twisted but whether consciously or unconsciously my aunt and uncle live in like a little apartment in Astoria, Queens. You said the gold, <laughs> and I said she came over here and realized that gold came bamboozled. from Church Avenue, okay. right next to the Kennedys. But I always <laughs> wondered, but okay. I always wondered why did the aunt and uncle, <laughs> why did the aunt bags from Canal Street? Why, why wouldn't they just tell the truth and go back and be like, y'all, it's hard out there. I'm working in a factory. Right, no, maybe. because we don't With like harsh yeah. conditions. The boss as a CS as humans like mm -hmm. not saying that America is all bad right. but it's definitely a system that is not designed for you to just come on over yeah, like right. we have you know? very we have to trouble the notion of labor mm -hmm. right um, and we and we are also have to interrogate what we consider sort of our the aim the prize the goal right and I think we have just been conditioned to sort of see jewelry and and like you know little things and that the are status we have reframed what what matters in such a problematic way right? right because we amass all of these trinkets whether they be gold uh jewelry or teslas right and you <laughs> think that when you have that you're going to be fulfilled right but you know what you learn is that you work and work and work and work and work just like we were talking about yesterday work and work and work and i just got one degree and two degrees and three degrees and, and four degrees four and, and then five. it's just like okay well then what right because you you don't really get <laughs> What your what your not, you don't find purpose or fulfillment until right. you sort of get off the hamster wheel. And the <laughs> thing about the hamster wheel that's interesting is like you know like with us we got out of the on the uh, corporate game right, mm -hmm. and it's like it becomes a self imposed prison then because it's so like yes. like Mariah would say emblazoned in my <laughs> mind, <laughs> so emblazoned in my mind. <laughs> And you know what I'm saying? Where it's like, I'm an entrepreneur and I've just recreated the corporate system for myself. Yes. I'm, I overwork, I mm -hmm. overextend, I don't have the best boundaries. What I mean, happened I'm learning. when I went on vacation? Fran hit me and was like, you better not answer email. You better and not answer. And that was answer. me talking to myself right, because right. I'm like, this is how I would love to be treated if I was on vacation. I would Absolutely. love for y'all to leave me alone. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would love for Absolutely. my friends to be like, you know what? I'm going to figure out what I need to do so that she can actually rest because we are fully aware of how much we don't rest. For exactly. sure. And it's interesting because we have created this schedule ourselves and it just yeah. goes to show like, you can be free and even mm -hmm. in your freedom recreate those same systems that Absolutely. you know that you know are not designed for you to uh, excel in a healthy way with right. boundaries mm -hmm. kind of like the fisherman he gets his fish and he goes you know yeah. and i think the most interesting part um is also the the division within the diaspora and this is a really tricky subject, so I'm going to tread lightly. <laughs> I'm only going to speak from my experience, of course. But what I found interesting, too, as my family came over, and obviously I'm first-generation American, first-born, so I was able to kind of be in that space of seeing both worlds. Mm -hmm. And even seeing like how my family would make remarks about, like, oh, black Americans have been here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And look how they haven't done anything with, you know, there's no political power, no generational wealth. And it's like, 
where do you see the separation here? <laughs> like my grandfather would be looking out the window and I'd be looking at him like, he's here judging all the black Americans that are out in the bench. And I'm like, no. brother, that's literally you. Mm -hmm. Shout out to We're Flatbush. We're all in the same, same system, thing. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it's, I'm surrounded. And, 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 I, and I love, I love my Caribbean people. My I mean, partner yeah. is Trinidadian. Of course. But there's been a lot of conversation, a lot of times with me being the only black American that black Americans are lazy. Well, you all had all these systems set up for you. Mm. And granted, there are systems that we have that that are that are hard to get. Right. Green cards. Uh, and the um, language bad. You know, like my mom that. had yeah. to go to night school to learn the it's language hard. to even be able to play the and game. And we don't in the make it place. easy either. Right. When we were young, what were we doing? We were running around calling people all kinds of disgusting epithets that we didn't even. But that's what I mean about we, we recreate the yeah, system within each even other within because we our are culture. taught to. Right. Yes. It is modeled for us, exactly. and that's what we have to remain conscious of right. at all times. And yes. that's right. The work. It yeah. is about distance. Thing. And I think even like within this conversation about systems, mm -hmm. we have to think about white supremacy as a system. And by design, it is, it is designed to distance us and th have us to think in very polarizing categorical ways. Um, I'm thinking about like, you know, white is right and black is wrong mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of it. Mm -hmm. And so what I've observed is like there's this distancing mm -hmm. from blackness mm -hmm. and we have to be really strategic about, uh, you know, uh, condemning um, and uh, shaming, you know, blackness in a, in a very intentional way mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we don't want to be considered, you know, we don't want to be like them. Mm -hmm. You know, I might look like a, a black American, but I want you to know that I'm not. I'm not right. like them. I'm lazy. I'm not lazy. You know, I've had and, you know, people have a lot of misconceptions about systems and everyone sort of uh, thinks that America is this place where you can everyone could come and make it. But that's only for a certain a certain demographic of Absolutely. people. Absolutely. That's right? why the old white the, men are always telling people when they, I watch a show, I don't know what to say, I watch a show where uh, somebody from America is engaged to somebody from another country. Oh, yes, I know this You know, show. for a certain period of oh, time. No. And you tried to get me to watch this show. I did. You know, one iteration of it, maybe the happily ever after, I don't know. But <laughs> they, they, I hear the fathers mostly, interestingly enough, Enough. The American fathers are always telling the person from the other country, especially if it's a man, all you have to do is come over here and work hard mm -mm. and, and you're going to nice. be able to take care of my daughter and the, and the baby that you put inside of her. Right. And it's like, uh, no, that's no. not how this is set up. No. Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> that ain't what it is. Pull yeah, yourself barriers. up by your cowboy bootstraps. And, and that's, that's doesn't, it's not, the, the, the playing field is not level. Exactly. And there are and absolute barriers. And they're doing barriers. work for them by absolutely. agreeing to this division. Yes, it's like absolutely. we're literally being employees of the system, of the software that yep. was created. And that's yep. what they designed it. They designed it for it to be self-sustaining in that way. Yes. Yes. And so it's conversations like this that interrupt it. Yes. It's cha it's to challenge it. It's to really zoom out and think about think about all of the the um, you know disparities and how difficult it is. The judgments. Black people are judged before we when we enter any space. Before we open our mouth, people make up our make up their minds about us, and that's in every space. And so we have to think about that marginalization literally sets us steps behind. So mm -hmm. like, you, it's not just I can go over here and work really hard and work my way up. It is not, it's more than just a notion. Right. And, and people have to really recognize how problematic and literally anti-black it is mm -hmm. for us to sort of have these these lines and these distinctions. Um, it's just, it's, it's not self-serving at exactly. all for us as a people. Right, and I was reading, so I was reading this book of Water and the Spirit by mm -hmm. Maladoma Somme. Mm -hmm. And he's an incredible writer in the fields of spirituality and scholar. Mm -hmm. Love his books and his wife as well. Um, he was born in Burkina Faso, right, mm -hmm. in West Africa. And he was abducted at the age of four by a Jesuit school. Oh, wow. Hmm. Intense. And then he came back 15 years later to his village and sat with his elders. And they said to him, you are now in a space where you have been indoctrinated by European thought, you know, the work ethic. I, th I think of, you know, in high school, did you read the Protestant work ethic yes. <laughs> in the spirit of yes. capitalism? Yes. Like, just how the focus on excellence and vocation. And his family and the elders said to him, it's not that you're no longer a part of us. You know, you always will be, 
but it's that now you have a new system that has been introduced to your thought and your way of moving and even the way that you run your energy in your body. So they told him, you're at that intersection. Mm -hmm. You're literally at an intersection now. And instead of feeling bad for it, mm -hmm. use that as a gift. Then now you can step back on an observation deck and see both worlds, see how to speak the language that each world needs to bridge the gap, mm. you know? And he was so thankful to the elders for not shunning him, you know, for not making him feel like he was no longer a part. But if anything, you have work to do now. Yes. And I feel like, oh, I just got chills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and we also have a fourth co-host, Trevor. Yeah, yeah I Trevor's see him, back. he has something to say. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that's the intersection. Yeah, that is. <laughs> but I feel like that's who we are. Yeah, you know, for and sure. that's what we represent. We are a people of two worlds. Yes. And it's kind of funny just to bring it back to the Paulo Coelho story. Mm -hmm. My mom left that farming village. And now I, after all this work she's done, working in factories, learning English, she went to college. I was teach, I was helping her with her college work mm -hmm. and her masters while other kids were having their parents help them with their mm -hmm. college and masters. And now I moved to Oregon from Harlem, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to start my own farm. <laughs> yes, yes. yes, we are. I'm essentially the, the fisherman saying, I'm back to my boat for sure, and yeah. my three fish. And my mom finds that so funny, because she's like, girl. I all of this for you to go and get I a farm. I said, all of this for you to get a yeah. farm. Yes. And we laugh about it, but it's like, what a blessing in a strange way that like we went through this revolution of circumstance and change mm -hmm. and just trying to move through the world through experience and curiosity and failure and mistakes and and now I can go into that farm but with awareness of what's really yes. happening in this world as yeah, well because my mom was sort of like I'm on a farm, it's you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah but choice. this is an intentional choice. There's yeah. no exploitation exactly. and I can move through the world knowing yes. like we talked yesterday yes. it's about having faith but also being fully, fully aware, aware. Mm -hmm. the yes. systems in place yes. and what's really really happening out Absolutely. here yes Absolutely. boundaries so, are only limiting when we don't know you know what i'm saying like it's about being a boundary it's about boundary spanning spanning mm -hmm. you know yes, yes. it's not a barrier when you know when you see it. when you see it <laughs> right. it's simply a boundary mm -hmm. and, yeah. and you can recognize the connections between them you can make choices to live in either space or both spaces mm -hmm. and you really sort of have it, our, our work is in reclaiming that power right yes. because you know otherwise it's it's like you feel like oh i have to exist in one way and or but no that's not that's not the truth right we always have the option and it's about reclaiming that option that that and that's where the freedom is right yep. and one thing i love about working with companies like target is just seeing the ways that they are helping our yes. communities as well. Because we go yes. in there and we spend money. <laughs> <laughs> and we time. work with them, you know, <laughs> on much. corporate levels, like yes. on these mm -hmm. campaigns. But it's beautiful to see what they're doing to help our communities, to help the money and the redistribution of wealth. And, you know, initiatives like Black Beyond Measure, like today, we're going to get to jump in with Essie Bartels yes. of Essie Spice, which yes. is launching yes. in Target. That's so exciting. I'm so happy. So let's jump in and talk to her and see what her experience has been as someone who she too is foreign born. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and how she's navigating the waters of success. I'm the owner of Essie Spice, a vegan sauce blend and spice company based in New Jersey and sending wonderful West African flavors all over the world. So how I got started in my mother's kitchen in Ghana. Every little girl in Ghana grows up in the kitchen. It's just the way it is. And then when you're also the first daughter, you're definitely stuck in the kitchen with your mom. And obviously when I was younger, I didn't really appreciate it as much, but when I realized what I could do with food, how I could bring people together, how people just get excited when you talk about their favorite dishes and just the warmth that food brought, I realized I could really express myself with that. And so it started from not really wanting to be in the kitchen. It felt like a chore to absolutely loving it. 
So the role my family and my culture played in me pursuing SC Spice, it's literally the reason um, that I started. Um, when I moved to the US uh, about 17 years ago, there was no West African main food brands on the shelves, in stores, in media, even African music that you hear now on the radio every day. That's like the first times I would hear music that's African on the radio, I, I would literally jump out of my skin because it was such a shock. So um, for me, I wanted to do that with food. And so I figured I can't have a restaurant because that's at one spot as opposed to sauces that can reach everybody everywhere. So I figured finding a way to bring that flavor bottled in a jar and sharing that love, that's how the brand started. So my family is full of entrepreneurs, but they still weren't so supportive in the beginning because I was doing something no one had done in a place where nobody had done it. Um, and I was veering off, way off my path. I was working full time in global procurement, traveling the world. And then I called my parents and said, you know, I've lost my job. Instead of getting a new job, how about I just continue making sauce? Um, and the sauces I was making was in very traditional West African. It's Part of that is West African, but also I infuse my travels into the sauces. So even they didn't understand it. So in the beginning, they were all very, very confused about what I was doing. But uh, as soon as, you know, everybody else got a wind of it, then they also uh, jumped on board. But now everybody's on board. So when I left Ghana, I was planning to study international business management um, and then French. And that's exactly what I did. Again, this is not something that is mainstream going into the food business, even growing up. Um, we didn't have people pursuing anything in the food sciences or somebody that you could look up to like a top chef or anything like that. So it wasn't like, oh, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a top chef or I want to go into food or anything like that. I wasn't something anyone aspired to. So my plan was go to school, get your degree, travel the world, go up the, um, you know, the ladder and just keep growing that way. And I was doing that. Um, and then I lost a job uh, after the recession. And so I used that to pivot. And uh, it was such a, a big chance on myself. I gave myself six months to see what will happen with SC Spice. And I told myself if nothing happened, I would go back to corporate. And in the six months, I got profiled on Time Magazine and Forbes. So it was the kicker that I needed. And that's how I knew. So it wasn't a linear path. It was definitely a lot of um, twists and turns. Some of my earliest challenges, and I think every entrepreneur knows this, is finances. And of course, people not believing in what you're doing. Um, and it's easy for people to jump on kombucha now, but think about the first person trying to sell kombucha. That was me trying to sell West African sauces in the US. I would go to stores and they would look at my jar and, oh, you're so hardworking. This is so nice. What do you do full time? Is this your full time job? Um, you know, they want to know if you believe in it, it um, enough so that they can believe in it. And so I had stores look at me and turn me away um, so many times, uh, applications so many times. And then somebody took a chance on me. And I will always tell people about Donna at Calustians in New York. And she was my first store and it started from there. And now we're going to be in about 400 stores very soon. And it starts with just one yes. How SC Spice connected with Target. This is another testimony through DMs. <laughs> I know every time I say it, even to my friends, they're like, so, so how did, how did Target find you? How did you get this Target gig? I'm like, you know, and I'm like, they sent me a DM. And it's crazy because I don't get propositioned in my DMs by men. 
I do get propositioned by businesses <laughs> and brands and Target sent me a, uh, a DM asking me if I wanted to be part of their accelerators and I was invited to take part in the accelerator program and I did and I also um, won the contract to um, supply my sauces into the store. So the long and short of it is I don't know anybody at Target, they found me in my DM. Finances and figuring out how to, you know, use what you have to then um, grow your business. I was very worried. And I remember when I told my parents that I would um, give a ceasefire six months. Um, and then if it didn't work out, I'll go back to work. My dad was like, don't come and ask me for money. And I was like, okay, sure. Uh, thank God for, um, uh, thank God for, uh, what is it called? Um, the severance and thank God for, you know, a little bit of a buffer. Um, I, 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 tack, I, I took out my 401k because I believed in the brand that much, um, because I had seen a little bit, I, I feel like sometimes God just shows you a little bit of what's possible just so you know, mm -hmm. and then you sow the seed. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, just you take this step and I'll take the rest of the steps. So um, even with this Target uh, launch, just before launching, the monies that I was supposed to get to get bottles, sauce, production, all of that, fell through like two months before. And so it was like scrambling to find all of this stuff. Um, but when you believe in something so much, um, money doesn't, you know, come into the equation. You, you find a way, you find grants, you find family that's going to support you, find people that believe in the dream. You work with the SBA. They're very good with um, SBA loans that are very low rate and they give you a long time to pay. So those are the ways that I've started to look at financing for SE Spice until it's time to um, raise some capital. beginning it was hard because I was literally a lone wolf and I hate that because it felt like I was by myself nobody had done anything that I was doing a lot of people didn't understand what I was doing so um, a lot of marketing goes into just educating as opposed to trying to sell because you can't sell something if people don't know what it is you're selling um, so it's been it's been tough but um, as the years have gone on and people have understood, you know, the origin of everything, right, in Africa, um, people are learning to go back to their roots, learning about our oils, our butters, our, our spices, our herbs, and learning how our ancestors ate, why they lived so long, why they were so healthy, why they had such beautiful skin, you know, all of that. And they're like, well, we want that too. And I'm glad that at least I can have a little voice in that. to the most is more young girls coming into this space, taking care, uh, taking charge of our narrative. Um, there's now a lot of um, other ethnicities, I must say, that are, um, that have a lot more money, have a lot more connection, people that can raise $2 million in two hours, right? And they are going to Senegal, they're going to Cameroon, finding our volcanic peppers and coming to tell that story. And so what I'm hoping for is that the next generation of young women, of young Africans are going to, you know, really get into the room Rooms, take charge of our stories, whether it's in music and art and, you know, be in the front of it and also in the back, take control of that whole narrative. That's what I really hope would happen moving forward. Knowing what I know now, I would still tell little Essie at six to be stubborn, to ask a lot of questions. You know, my mom is very traditional, 
West African Ghanaian woman. Um, she would make chili the way her mom taught her. And the reason why Essie Spice is what it is is because I wouldn't do it exact same way. Um, and that's because I would watch, you know, Chef Yan on TV on Food Network. I would watch sh shows in Brazil. I would watch shows from China of how people are cooking and how soy sauce is made. And I'm like, well, how about if I add marjoram? And she's like, why would you add marjoram? Because I want to. And, um, you know, she would buy a whole rack of spices and only use black pepper, salt, and like bay leaf. And then there's like 10 of them still there. I'm like, what are these still doing here? So I would experiment. And so I would still tell Essie to do what she wanted to do, how she was feeling, all the things she wanted to try. Keep trying because it's going to get you so much further than the mother's kitchen. Remember I mentioned, you know, coming into the awareness of the system, uh, seeing how I participate, like my aunts and uncles with the jewelry. <laughs> but I don't even think that's how I participated, yeah. obviously, because I wasn't going back to DR mm -hmm. to flex. <laughs> Fake flex. Fake flex, right? Fake flex, <laughs> But, and you know, I get it, auntie, uncle. Yeah, I was trying oh, to make yeah, the no best shade. of it. Yeah, no, no, no shade. shade. It's just jokes. Um, <laughs> But the way that I participated, because you have to also be accountable, is like my energy. Mm. You know, how it was harvested as well. When we're talking about farms, this mm -hmm. is their farm. This right. is their mm -hmm. seeds planted. Right. And by me participating in it, whether it's trying to get into the Ivy League schools, you know, mm -hmm. uh, moving away from my intuitive interests and hits and callings and just focusing more on what how I'm being perceived as opposed to how I want to feel, mm -hmm. you know? And once you make that choice, which is a really hard choice to make, because mm -hmm. we also have high rents, yes. <laughs> we have bills to pay, and sometimes those creative callings don't necessarily pay in a way mm -hmm. that's sustained. So I don't fault anyone for the decisions they make. Mm -hmm. I can only speak, you know, for myself, but that's a lot of why, not saying I have it figured out, but even just becoming an entrepreneur and creating yeah. conversations like this with my friends, like what a blessing, I'm getting paid for this, this yes. is my work. Yeah. Um, and, and the types of conversations that we create on our individual shows, you know, like that to me is how I'm taking my power back. Like yeah. you said, this is a game of power. For sure, yeah. and we get, to, we get to redefine what work means. Right, right? We get right. to redefine what success means. And how it feels in our bodies. And how it feels in our bodies. Yeah. And we recognize that it's a privilege to get the opportunity to do that. And right. sometimes we have to do what we have to do until we can do what we want to do. Amen. And it's just about, you know, sort of recognizing the way that this works. And sometimes you have to work until you get to the point where you can make that decision. Right. Um, and it takes time. So it's no stress and it's no uh, judgment or fault to anyone who's still on the hamster wheel because many of us still are <laughs> in, yeah. many, in many ways. Yeah. But it's about while, while I'm on it, I'm recognizing the problems uh, within the conventional ways that I was like sort of trained and mm -hmm. to be. Right. Mm -hmm, and sure. you know something, too, that that just kind of triggered the thought is why, and I know this is going to sound really weird, but I always get kind of, like, irritated during award shows or even, a lot of us do it. I've done it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I've done it on the podcast, but it's like, we are people who kind of made it because sometimes some people make it, you know, even through the system. It's like we mm -hmm. kind of found a little yeah. corner and finessed it or whatever, or just by the right people at the right time, you know, just everything mm -hmm. aligning how it needed to. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with faith. Of mm -hmm. course, I'm a faith-based person, and I do feel Very that you much. can will and change um, within the system. But I do get it irritated at us because we love to be like, if I could do it, you could do oh, it too. Oh, oh, I don't <laughs> like ever say that. Like all those speeches. <laughs> I don't, like those no. speeches because no. it's like, I always think of the person that's at home with all these, you know, mm -hmm. boundaries and borders and obstacles looking at you like, girl, what? Like, like I work I at a call start, center and you know? I hate everything you're saying yes. right now. Yes. <laughs> and that disconnect. And, and yep. I remember people used to like, uh, feel so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? 
triggered by mm-hmm. me when I was online. And I used to be like, why are they triggered? I'm just living my best life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then making I realized, deodorant. And you know like, what I'm saying? are making deodorant at 2 o'clock on a Wednesday. You know <laughs> what I'm doing? Working. <laughs> They're like, you're on In Instagram, like, filming yourself exactly. with powder lips. And I'm like, isn't this what you want? <laughs> and it's just like a disconnect yeah, from is. the reality. So I can understand how those things can be really triggering. So it's not that you shouldn't live your best life because you absolutely should, but just be mindful of the circumstances and how you speak to them and what Mm -hmm. the realities are. And even people that are faith-based, oh, pray your way out of it. Sure, you can pray through a lot of things. It grounds you. I understand the benefits and the connection, but let's be real about the circumstances that we're living in as well. You know, it's just, Mm -hmm. like you said, it's just the awareness of what's happening. And so the last piece is how we are creating change. Mm -hmm. You know, I think sometimes it can feel really daunting. Like, how can I change the system that has been in place for how many Mm -hmm. years now? How do I even do that? Can I do that? You almost feel like, can I make a dent, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I always think in local terms, like, working with my friends, the mm-hmm. redistribution of wealth, whether it might not be a lot, I'm not a millionaire, I'm not out here yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the hypocrisy. I know, right? <laughs> Just dripping, baby. Uh, <laughs> but, ain't that funny? It happens. But I think the, the beauty of it is that the little money that I do get, I'm always considering how do I spread this? Absolutely. Like even with my outfit today, mm-hmm. This is a very small detail, but this is a black-owned company. Same. Fee Noel. You know what I'm Same. saying? Same. Hanifa. Hanifa official. You know, this is Jada Hall J. Hey! Hey! Look, Trevor came back for hey, you. Tra- Trevor. <laughs> Trevor. <laughs> All right, listen here. We're not playing with Trevor today. Even our director of photography, shout yes, out to Reginald out to Louise Reggie. Jacques. Like, yes. you know what I'm saying? Like. We have uh, the catering. We have Kitchen Finesse. We have Zanab mm-hmm. Eka, mm-hmm. who did all the set design. And it's just Even Mary. Even the project management. The project management you know, by Mary We're Akpa. in the studio. Mary we're in a black, um, black sure woman-owned studio. No. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're in a black-owned studio. Yes. Full yes. Court studio. Yes. So, like, as soon as we get these opportunities, I think when you can consider this isn't just about me but it's like if we're trying to really yes. progress in some in Absolutely. all these capacities this is what my version of change is and it might be small but it's mighty yeah. because we you know we can eat together Absolutely. and to me this is back to that story about the fish you know he was grateful for the connection to earth let me be woo woo again hi right. everyone <laughs> but it's like the earth was blessing him with this abundance that he considered he considered abundance you know and to us this is exactly what we're doing you know we're just giving from our pot Mm -hmm. sharing it like we talked in our meeting one day like everyone's the crabs in a barrel fighting for this one carrot but Mm -hmm. we're just planting the seeds to have a garden of carrots so so that everyone can eat everyone can eat you know and then those are the ways that stepping back on the observation deck the intersection of race and class. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do my part as best as I can because like I said, I haven't figured it out, but I'm just doing my part. And at the end of the day, that's all we can do. I want to, I want to challenge what you said. It's small. Mm -hmm. It's not small. I like to think of it as like incremental. Okay. It's working toward making a larger change. I love that. It's cumulative. So we're starting here, but it is substantial that we as three black women were able to provide work for all of these black owned and operated businesses. Come on. And that's what contributes to the larger ecosystem. So it's not small. And serving as an example. Absolutely. Because it makes other people consider that. You know, those watching us, those working with us. And that's how you change the world. Oh, oh, we forgot to shout out NL Makeup as well. NL Dude. Makeup. Hello. Do you see these beats? And my braids. Yes. Your friends out here looking like a she and Batty. <laughs> I'm giving you baddie today. My braider, the Bayesian braid. I found a braider in Portland, y'all. Like, come on. Shout when you out. when you, you seek and you shall find. Okay? Yes, you shall. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. you've got to seek hard. Oh, because but... listen, it took a while, but I found her. Shout out to you. But... All that to say, all yes. jokes aside, we hope that you enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much to Essie Bartels of Essie Spice. We're so 
proud of you and excited for, sure. for you yes. and looking forward to buying some spices <laughs> and cooking down with your gifts and your talents. Thank you to Target for Black Beyond Measure and the initiative to help us as creatives and the initiative that we're taking as creatives to help the world. so much for listening you've heard our thoughts and now we'd love to hear yours have you ever considered the mental emotional and spiritual costs of the american dream if so how has this awareness informed how you live your life have you ever felt torn between your calling and society's expectations what are your ideas for how we challenge the myths of meritocracy and upward mobility in our communities? In a system that rewards individualism, how do we create space for acknowledging the importance and utility of collectivistic principles and practices? Answer these discussion questions in the comments below.